You know, the most important thing for a new believer is to get to know the Heavenly Father. Sometimes you might struggle or misunderstand God's good intentions because you don't really know who he is. If a stranger walked up to you today on the street and said, okay, I want to do something really good for you. Just give me all your information, your birth date, your, your uh, social security number, your bank account, and, and I'm going to do something really good. Would you give it to him? No, not if you're smart, you wouldn't. Mm -mm, it's a stranger. Don't know that person. But what if it was someone in a position to really bless you, to really make you prosper, to really make good things happen in your life, somebody that you know and you trust? You might think differently. Well, see, God's like that. We need to get to know him. We need to know what he's like, his personality, his character, his way of thinking. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, God talks about the plans he has. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. God has plans. And you know what? He's been making these plans since before you were born. If you look at Psalms, Psalm 139, and Psalm 139, verse, what we got? Verse 16. It says, Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written. The days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are thy thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I am awake, I am still with thee. God says, before you were even born, when you were just some people don't even want to call it a baby anymore. They want to call it an embryo or fetus or anything to dehumanize it. But no, God saw a person. He saw a person developing inside a mother's room, and he started making plans. This person's going to be born. And when they're five, this is going to happen. When they're 10, and when they're 15, and then when they're 23, and then this, and then that, and the other, God's making plans for you. And they're all good plans. What kind of plans does God make? What did we just read? Plans for welfare, not calamity. Some people think, which is a mistake, that God determines that some people are just going to have a bad life. And it's just all fate or whatever you want to call it. That's called fatalism. God is not that way. God does not plan for anybody's life to go sour. God's plans are for welfare, to give you a future and a hope. God's plans are good. God's plans are always good for you. Now, he doesn't take away your ability to make choices. Just because God made plans does not mean that you can't go against them. And a lot of people do. And some people never do go on God's way. But you know what? If tonight you discovered you have never really walked in God's path, it's okay. We can make a change tonight. Um, in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you've never come, invited Jesus into your heart, you've never walked in the path of God, and you know your life is a mess. And you might be wondering why. Well, why is my life a mess? Because you've never done it God's way. He had good plans, remember? You can do it right now. You can just stop and say, God, I'm sorry. I messed it up. I haven't listened to a thing you said. I've just done my own thing. I've been stubborn. And just forgive me, please, and come into my heart. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. If we just pray something like that, it's not a set, set of words. It's got to come from your heart. God, help to me. God, come into my heart. Um, he will, and he'll change everything around. Or sometimes people haven't been with God for a while, but they got away. Well, that's okay. God takes care of that one, too. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he said, If we confess our sins... He's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you walked with God, but you got away from him, all you got to do is go back. Sometimes Christians mess up and they think, well, I messed up. God can't forgive me anymore. It's over. I've heard of people giving up before they ever got really started. 
been saved a week or two weeks or a month or something and made a mistake and maybe cussed someone out or lost a timber or whatever they did. They did something and they know I shouldn't have done that. And then they get all discouraged and they want to give up. But God says, no, 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 don't give up. We're just starting this journey here. Just come back. And if you know you messed up, you know you sinned, you just come back and say, God, I and this say it by name. Don't try to make it look pretty because it's not. And God knows anyways. God, I lost my temper. God, I cussed somebody out. God, I was really rude to that person. God, I whatever you did, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God, forgive me, please. And you know what? Jesus is right there. He says, okay, you're sorry. I take care of it. My blood paid the price for you. I've already come and I've given my life so you can be forgiven and you can get back on my path. You see, there is no excuse for anyone alive to not walk in the plans of God. Because no matter where you are in life, God has a way to get back on his path. You know, when Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah 29, he was talking to Israel. And at that time, Israel was in Babylonian captivity. It was not nice. Their country had been taken over by the Babylonians. They were drug off to another country. And there were people standing up and saying, oh, oh this can't be God. This can't, God can't be allowing this to happen, so he's going to take us back. And there they were false prophets getting up telling them, oh, God's going to take us back, and he's going to get rid of Nebuchadnezzar and all that stuff. And you know what? God spoke to Jeremiah and said, that's not how it's going to be. Not yet. Why not? They had a lesson to learn. You see, those people of Israel, they had made it possible for Satan to attack them because they were living in such horrible sin. You know, they were sacrificing their children to idols, making them walk through the fire. They were committing all kinds of immorality and all kinds of horrible things. And God kept sending prophets to them, and one after another after another, and they wouldn't listen, and they wouldn't listen. You know what? If you walk away from God long enough, you open the door of your life for the devil to come in. And when the devil comes in, the devil only does three things. Remember John 10, 10, the thief comes, the devil's a thief. He comes to steal and he comes to kill and he comes to destroy. Anytime you let the devil in your life, he's going to do one of those things. He's going to try to take something from you. Well, that's what happened to them. They let the devil in their life and the devil attacked. All right. And now they're drug off to another country. And now God wanted to teach him something. See, he had plans. He had plans. He said, no, you're going to be here for 70 years. You're going to be here for 70 years, build a house, plant a garden, get married, have kids, raise them, and do your best right here. Because those people needed to learn a new way of thinking. They needed to start going back to God. They needed to learn to trust God again and not just follow whatever they felt like. And at the end of 70 years, God kept his word. He let them back out of there again. It was learning time for them. See, God had a plan. God has the big picture, you know. He sees things far ahead that you've never seen. And someone may ask, well, but can I really trust God? You know, this is a matter of knowing him. Can I really trust God that his plans for me are something that I'm going to want? Some people think God is all religious, but that's not so. You know, God's really not religious. He's just God. He doesn't look for forms and rituals. He looks for relationship. He looks for his kids to come and say, Father, I'm here. Whatever you want, I'm here. And he says, okay, come on. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. The Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've drawn you with loving kindness. Again, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's why I've drawn you with loving kindness. The love of God is unfailing and unending. And he said, I built you before and I'll rebuild you again. So no matter what kind of a mess you made out of your life, God can bring you back on the path. I'll rebuild I'll set up again the things that should be there in your life. Is God trustworthy? You might say, do I really? Can I really trust God? Well, yes. And let's look at just a couple reasons why we know we can trust God when he says, I'm going to lead you. First of all, he gave his most precious possession for us. You know, God doesn't care about gold and silver and jewels. And he doesn't look for power, 
people like power games, but God has all the power in the universe. Why should he go looking for it? Why should he care for gold? He walks on it every day. Streets of heaven are paved in gold. This is not valuable to God. One thing was valuable to God. That was his only son. God gave his most valuable possession for people who were spitting in his face. People who refused to listen to what he said because he loved them that much. First John chapter 4 tells us. First John 4, 9 and 10. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is just a big word for substitute. Jesus took our place. See, our loving God is obvious. Why would we not love him? But the fact that God loved us, huh, yeah, that's pretty big. Another reason why we can trust God, because he's always looking out for you. In 1 Peter chapter 5, in the Amplified Classic, 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. Now, this is written longer because it explains more, so we'll take time with it. 1 Peter 5, 6, therefore humble yourselves, demote, Lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you. Casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him. For he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Let's look at that one verse, verse 7, for just a moment. God is saying... You can give me everything that you're worried about, everything that makes you anxious, everything that concerns you. Just give it to me, and don't give it to me and take it back. God doesn't like that. Give it to me and leave it there. In other words, God, I give you this thing. Now, I'm not touching it. I'm just going to trust you. It says he cares about you affectionately and about you watchfully because he loves you, and he's watching out for you. That's why you can trust him. Another reason why we know we can trust God, Jeremiah 1. Because he made plans before we were even born. Listen to what he said to Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet. To the nations before I formed you, I knew you. How could God know you before you're here? Remember, He's writing those days in a book. So before Jeremiah wasn't even developed, he was a twinkle in his father's eye, and God was already planning. This guy Jeremiah will be born, and he will be a prophet for me. God makes plans that far in advance. And one more reason why we know we can trust Him: He gave the Holy Spirit to live with us. To teach us, to guide us, to correct and to comfort and to help us. John chapter 14, he tells us that. Jesus, right before he, he went to the cross, he told the disciples, he knew they were going to be upset. And so he told them, it's going to be okay. John 14, verse 16 and 17, and then verse 26. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. Verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. The Holy Spirit, the Helper. He's called the Helper. Why? He's there to help us. He's there to help us, to remind us of things, to teach us stuff, to comfort us, to tell us what is true and what isn't true. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit so we would never have to be alone. We can trust him. You know something else God will do for you if you'll just walk on his path? He'll help you let go of the past. Isaiah 43. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19. It says, Do not call to mind the former things. Or ponder things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? 
I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Sometimes things from the past try to affect today and tomorrow. There are things sometimes we have to just let go of. Just let go. God, okay, you said you're going to do something new. How about the things I messed up? Could you? Can you get me out of that? Yeah, I can get you out of that. I'm doing something new. He said, roadways in a wilderness. You ever been in a wilderness? No paths? You're wandering around. You know, should I go left or right? Whatever. Where should I go? It's kind of scary. But then you find a path. And when you get on that path, ah, oh, ah, oh, the path is going to take me somewhere. I'm going to get to the right place if I just go on a path. God said, I'm going to make that path in that wilderness, in rivers, in the desert. You know, the desert doesn't have a lot of value, we say. It's just, you know, dry and useless. But when rain comes, when the waters come, the desert blooms. God's bringing waters into the desert parts of our lives, trusting God to take us out of the past. Something else he does, Psalm 139, he shines a light in the dark places of your life and leads you out of it. Now, I think a lot of us can relate to this, these verses. I've been there at times. Psalm 139, verse 11 and 12. If I say... Surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness isn't dark to thee, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to thee. Have you ever felt so overwhelmed like everything's dark, like your whole life is just hopeless and there's no way forward? When your life feels that dark, remember... Give God a call. Hey, God, I need help here. God says, hey, wait a minute. Give me a chance. You know, First John chapter 1 tells us God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So every time God shows up on the scene, light is there. Darkness has to go because God's there. He takes care of that darkness in our lives. How does he do this? Two ways, through his word. And through the Holy Spirit. Psalm 119, 105 tells us. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Years ago when I was living in Austria before I was married. I was had been working. I think we we had an outreach in Vienna or something. And I had to come home on the train by myself for some reason. And see our mission where we lived was on the side of a mountain. We lived in Reichenau on the rocks, it was called. The side of that mountain was our house. It had been an old hotel. And then in the valleys below, there was Reichenau, and then there was Peierbach. And the train came in from Vienna into Peierbach. And I had to walk up the mountain to get back to the mission. I started off walking that night. It was after dark by myself, and I had to go through a dark tunnel. You know, I was a little bit nervous. Lord, you know, it's not like those people are are nicer than here. People that don't know Jesus are the same way everywhere. So I just prayed for protection. Angels, you know, keep danger far away. And then I looked at the end of that tunnel. There was one light, just one light bulb hanging there. And I just fixed my eyes on that light. If I just walk toward that light, I'm getting out of this darkness. I just walked toward that light, and I kept walking, and I kept walking. God, you're with me. You're going with me. This is scary, but you're here. Yes, he was. Got me out of that tunnel, got me outside into the moonlight again, and there was one street light, and the street light was right at the end of the path to go up the mountain. Ah, now I knew where to go. I started following that light up the path. Now I got up a little bit, and there were no lights. There's no lights on the mountain, but the moon was there. The light of God was there. It was more than enough. Go up the mountain, climbed up by myself, went down the street in the dark, just praising God. That's okay. God's here. Until I hit my mission house and there was light. Open the door. Oh, the light bulbs are on. Oh, yeah, it's light in here for real. See, God will take you through that darkness if you just keep your eyes on him. Just keep looking at the light. Keep looking at the light. Don't get your eyes off the light. He's the light, remember. He takes you out of that darkness. No need to live in darkness when he's here. How can I find God's plan for my life? Two ways. We need to spend time with God. 
Remember I said one of the biggest needs in the life of, of a new believer and the life of every believer is getting to know their father. If you don't get to know God, you're going to misunderstand him over and over. And you're going to miss what he's trying to say. You need to get to know him. I remember during the time, between the time that I was, my husband and I were engaged to the time we got married, I moved to his part of the country because the mission was a different part of the country and moved with the pastor's family until we got married. And we saw each other every day. And you know, by the time we got married, I had a whole different picture. See, we were just communicating with letters and phone calls and occasional visits. But now we started seeing each other every day. And I learned a whole lot more about him and he learned a lot more about me. And so when we got married, I felt like, I know this guy. I know this guy. Not why we spend time together. We just spend time together. It's the same way with God. You got to spend some time with him to get to know him. Psalm 119, verse 130 tells us the unfolding. Psalm 119, 130. Yes, that's right. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. God will show you stuff if you'll just read the Bible. The unfolding of your words gives light. Have you ever been reading the Bible and, and suddenly you see something, you go, oh, wow, I understood something. Oh, man, I, I didn't understand that before. Oh, wow, I see something. It'll happen all the time when you read the Bible. When you start reading the Bible and you're not, you need to focus mostly on the New Testament because the New Testament is for the church. Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament in the New. The Old Testament is important and it's valuable and we do need to read it. But most of the time we need to spend in the epistles, in the letters to the church, in Acts, in the letters to the church, read the Gospels, read about the life of Jesus, read these things so you get to know him better. And then you got to take time and pray. you got to talk to him. And again, he's not looking for fancy words and there's no need trying to make things look pretty because he knows what you're thinking anyways. You might as well just tell him how it is, what you're feeling, what you're thinking, what your questions are, and then take time to listen. So many times I <sighs> were tempted to pray, oh God, I need this and that and this and that and that and this and this and that and that and help me out today, amen, and jump up and run out the door and take off somewhere. And God's going, excuse me, I had something to say. If, if, if you just give me a moment, I might tell you something. Maybe I could prevent you from having problems later on. Maybe I could give you some wisdom and something that you don't know. I want to guide you. I want to help you. I want to lead you, but, but you won't listen. We got to listen. Take time to listen. God's always ready to listen to us. We got to take time and listen to him too. Years ago, 19 years old, going on 20 I finished Bible school in California. I was praying about what should I do with my life. I trained for ministry, but I had no idea how to go forward. God, what will I do? Someone had suggested, uh, some my counselors had suggested going to Youth of the Mission in Austria and joining Slavic ministries. And that was kind of dangerous. Working behind the Iron Curtain at that time, Christians were getting arrested, you know. Should I really do that? I wasn't sure about it. So I was praying. And... Not being that old in the Lord yet, um, I kind of pray, oh, God, show me what to do. God, please show me what to do. I don't know if I should do this or not. I really don't know. God, would you just show me? Would you tell me what to do? God, I'm really just, I don't know. And this, you know, those kind of prayers. You ever pray those kind of prayers? Just kind of jumbled and all over the place. And, oh, God, show me, show me, show me, show me, you know, <laughs> getting all worked up. And finally, I think God was probably saying, oh, good night, child. And finally, I knew inside I heard, go sit down and do your Bible reading. And my heart sunk. I thought, oh, no. You see, in that Bible school, we had uh, Bible reading plans. They had us reading a lot. We read the Bible at least three times in the two years through all the way. And so I thought, okay, my daily right shoot. I'm in the Old Testament right now. Well, God can't say anything to me there. And I sat down and I obeyed because I knew he told me, go sit down and do your Bible reading. And I started reading. I was in Isaiah. And then I came to this one place. And then all of a sudden exactly what I was asking. The answer to my prayer was right there in the Word if I had just quit fussing and read the Bible and give God a chance to talk to me. You see, when I got quiet enough for Him to talk, He had the answer ready. I read that ch chapter that night and I knew this is what God has. That's right. I knew that I knew I'm going the right way. Now fast forward about five and a half years from then. I'm praying again. A little bit more experience this time. 
I've been praying and believing God for a while. And now, though, I'm praying about getting married. And you see, I was going to marry an Austrian. And, and we're from two different countries with two different languages. And I was Protestant. He was Catholic. And there was a whole lot of things that were just concerning to me. Lord, should I really do this? Is this really what you want? Is it really what you want? And I thought, well, this is a really big prayer, you know. I think with a prayer of this magnitude, I should get a sign. You know, maybe he could have arrived in the heaven, Mary Vanna or something like that. But you know what? Inside, the first thing God said to me was, stop that. You know my voice. And he was right. You see, in, uh, what is it, John 10, 27, God had made us a promise. John 10, 27, if you can find that. So Jesus, mm, 27. Can you find that one for me? Yeah, John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This is a promise from God that you're going to hear his voice. If you're his sheep, you're his sheep if you're born again. He said, you're going to hear my voice, and I know you, and you're going to follow me, because I'm going to show you where to go. God's big promise to me. And he said, you know my voice. And guess what? I did. Holy Spirit was already talking to me on the inside. I already had just had this sense, this is right. This is what I need to do. I knew it inside, but I just wanted some confirmation. And God said, oh, no, just listen to my voice. And I said, all right, you're right. Then he gave me scripture. And in that scripture, it was very clear. All those questions I was sowing at God like it was so impossible. You can't deal with all this. He answered it within a couple verses. God knows how to do that. See, he knows how to tell us what we need to know. He knows how to communicate with us, and he's already seen ahead, remember? He's a big picture, God. He's seen down the road. God wants to lead us in the practical aspects of life. Isaiah 48, 17. He says, This is the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you to profit who leads you in the way you should go. God said, I will teach you to profit. Do you need to profit? Yeah, I do. I'm sure you do too. There are things you need to know in your life. I'll teach you how to profit, and I'll lead you in the way you should go. This is very practical, very practical. If we'll just take time and listen to God, he'll lead you, and he'll show you what his plans are. You know, God's thinking is a bit different than ours. Isaiah 55, verse 8 God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, declares the Lord. That's why we got to take time and listen to what he has to say. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. See, his ways are higher and his thoughts are higher. We might see into tomorrow. Well, if I do this thing today, tomorrow's going to be going to be really busy. And he thinks, forget that. Get busy tomorrow because three weeks down the road, it's going to look better for you. See, God's looking ahead, making plans. His thoughts are bigger. His ways are higher. He knows how to go, and he knows how to get you there. One more verse. Proverbs 4.18. 4.18. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Let's read it again. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. You know when the sun's coming up? It's really dark. And it starts to get lighter and lighter. It shines brighter and brighter till the full day and then the sun's up and the lights come. God has that for us. God's path for us is increasingly bright. Yes, there'll be obstacles. Yes, there'll be things you could stumble. You could fall, but he's there to help you. He's there to lift you up again and show you that bright path. God's plans for you. Remember, welfare, not calamity, and future, and a hope. Let's thank God for that in just a moment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of following you. I thank you that your plans are so good and so high, way higher than mine. I thank you that you're light in the darkness, that you've got wisdom that I way beyond my understanding. And tonight, Father, we just want to give ourselves to you again and ask you, Lord Jesus, help us to walk in your path. Help us to simply trust you and to follow where you're leading. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name.